Time you get time? So that's good. Actually, all the people that really, with the exception of Dave, who's going to give a clinic here at the end, there's nobody online that is uh, that needs to vote for this. So that's cool. Make it make it a little easier. But uh, welcome everybody to the annual meeting. I know I'm calling it an annual meeting in quotes because I don't know if we really do it every year, but this is uh, a requirement that we're supposed to be doing. And then it's a should. It's definitely a should. Right? We just don't. Um, so we're going to go through the normal stuff with division business, a couple of clinics, and then there's layout tour. Um, the, the double X on my agenda is I forgot to add in there that Amato's is open too. So uh, there's actually two kind of layout tours with Amato's being open and then the, uh, the other one there that uh, we'll talk about at the end. So the first thing, we're going to run through all the business here, division business. This is the once every 10 years I'm not kidding you. This happens once every 10 years. We have the ones back to 1953, the first time that somebody reviewed and uh, updated the Constitution and the bylaws of the division. So, and I want to thank having 15 people in this room because the rules as they state today say you have to have 15 people here to vote to, to change them all. So I'll, I'm going to turn the floor over to John. John's going to explain to you what we have changed in the bylaws and the Constitution. And then we're going to vote on that uh, as soon as he's done. So, John, if you want to come up here, we are recording the, uh, the, the video stream as well so people can see you. Okay. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I, uh, a while back, I wrote uh, about the committee. You're looking at the committee with some help, I have to say thank you. Um, as you just heard, the superintendent is tasked with amending, reviewing and amending the Constitution of the Bylaws every 10 years. 2021 was that 10-year period. Um, 
can just, some of you have heard this before, so humor me, pretend you didn't. But the, the two documents here are distinct, the Constitution and the bylaws, and yet they're very interdependent. Mm -hmm. The Constitution is basically a charter, it's our mission statement. The bylaws are a self-governing document, tell us how to get there. And what I've found is, in going through the documents, is that over the years, provisions from one have bled over to the other. And, well, it looks like I did a lot of work. Basically, what I did was cut and paste. I removed a lot of the bylaws type of procedural uh, provisions that had found their way into the Constitution and put them back in the bylaws where they, uh, where they belong. Uh, that said, there are a few substantive uh, revisions, not the least of which is my failing eyesight. Um, and that is, in the prior bylaws, it said that the superintendent would be elected every year, but could not serve. Um, you know, could not serve for more than two two terms in a row. So. Um, what would happen is, and we've seen this in recent years, a superintendent resigns midterm. And the only person, I was going to say uh, available, the only person willing to become the acting superintendent is a prior superintendent. Well, that's really in violation of the bylaws. So what I added to it was, in that situation, a prior superintendent could be an acting superintendent until the next annual meeting despite the fact that he or she had been the immediately past superintendent. Uh, basically, all it's doing is codifying what we've, we've done anyway. The second substantive change was, again, just accepting, codifying what we've been doing, is that is to make the superintendent a member ex officio of all the committees. He or she does that. I don't know if there's ever been or she, but anyway, yeah. trying to be correct. Uh, Kaylee. Yeah. Um, does that anyway. Uh, it's a small organization, the superintendent is involved, so we might as well make it official. Uh, third is um, a uh, paying homage to what's happened in technology in the uh, past 10 years. And even though during COVID we were holding meetings virtually, there was no authority for that in the, in the bylaws. So I've added to both documents that meetings could be held virtually, votes can be taken virtually, provided that by silent virtually could theoretically be a conference call, uh, any electronic means, so long as people on both sides can hear each other and a vote can be registered. Those are the changes. Not very many. Somebody did a good job of them today. Yeah, thank you very much, John. So basically, they're very short documents. Document. They're a page or two. We did post them on the Facebook page for people to see them if you had a chance to review them. It's a very, very simple, very cut and dry documents, but it is something we're required to do every 10 years, which is why I would like to thank John for doing the review and, and cleaning the stuff up a little bit. And for us, to be honest with you, without virtual, I don't know how we would do this. I don't know how we'd run this. We do every board meeting virtually. Um, you know, we don't get together to do those meetings, and we do them off cycle from, from these meetings. But, uh, so I will entertain a motion to pass the Constitution and bylaws as amended by John and posted on the Facebook site. Ron, make a motion. I would need a second. Got a second. So thank you, James. And so then I'll ask for a vote. All in favor of passing the, the amended uh, Constitution and bylaws? All four? Aye. Any uh, objections? So passed. Thank you very much. Hey. So I can I can I can drop the mic. I had one thing to do with them for ten years. That's it. Done. And well, that's I really don't care about the next one. That was mine because the next one's whether or not John Game has another job for another year. So uh, those who don't know, at the annual meeting is actually when the director positions end. They don't end on the calendar year. They end on the on the annual meeting. So uh, John. His first term ends officially right now, so he got the one thing done he needed to get done, which is the Constitution. So he, he's running on a platform of undefeated accomplishments is really what his platform is. Um, 
do we have, I don't think anybody is running against John. Is that correct, Ron? Unless there's any nomination. I guess, I guess I'll start there. I'll open it to the floor. Does anybody want to uh, nominate somebody or themselves to run for the board of director position that starts now and runs for three years? Okay, don't everybody sit on their hands. Good. <laughs> Good. So John has graciously agreed to serve a second term, so he is the only nominee. So uh, I, I don't, we don't need, I, get, I don't need a nomination. We just need a vote, right? Or not? I guess I nominate him, right? I nominate John Gam to be the uh, director starting today for three years. There's a second from Ron. All in favor of John Gam being the board of director? Oh, it looks like it's a sweep. This looks like North, North Korean voting right here. 100%. Everybody's in on John. Anybody opposed to John? I don't care. So, all right. Congratulations, John. An amazing first three years and three more years starting today. Good, good job. And then at some point, since Mark Newtrup is not here, you, John, and Mark need to get together to decide who will be the superintendent for the next year. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I say you and I vote since Art's not here. You know what I mean? I think we know who to stick with this. We'll get together with this. We'll make sure Art had, Hey, Art decided he'd go skiing for one last ski trip, like in New Hampshire or Vermont or something. Yeah, no. Nah. He's going to get stuck with that. Okay. Um, one of the things we do in division business before we get to the clinics is kind of give you guys a layout of the things that are going on across the region. I always keep up there the national convention. It's going to be in St. Louis. Anybody plans on traveling out there? It is in August 7th to 13th. Train show-wise, there is uh, things per percolating on the calendar. Today, actually, there's a thing called the Layout Tour on layouttour.com, which if, uh, if you look at, there's nine different layouts that are open today, and they're in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. So if you want to go to that website, I, that's why I'm just leaving it at a website, you guys can go look at the website, Pick the one you want to go see. I think they closed at 4 o'clock was the last. I think all the layouts closed at 4 o'clock today if you wanted to do that. There's one or two that supposedly will be open maybe 5 or 6. Okay, good. You have to look at the individual. And, and I, that website has all, all nine of them listed and where they are, directions and addresses and all the things you need if you have any interest to go see those today. Um, May 14th in Peabody, Mass is the next one. I don't know why it's called North Shore Con, but that's what it's called. Um, but if anybody wants to go to that, it seems like it's a combination uh, train show activities. And then, then the day after that, maybe I don't know where Rayham Mass is relative to Peabody. Maybe they're back to back to make a weekend of it. But the old Colony Model Railroad Club has their open house. And then uh, Chester, Massachusetts has a train show called Chester on Track on the 21st. So uh, there are good things in there. I only put the train shows that I'm aware of between now and the next meeting. Okay, so if anything's past June, I don't put it on here, but there are, that's why I put the thing at the bottom. There are things filling in the summer for June, July, and August that are, that are pretty good. And if anybody, you know, you know, bend my ear after this, uh, if you want the list, I can just send you the list. Ron has the list. He sent it to me about all the train shows that are coming up that we know of. Uh, in the division, uh, uh, division business, we also cover regional business. Uh, so the, I mentioned last time, if people weren't here, we have a lot more people here than last time, so I figured I'd keep this in. The NER website does have a new look. Uh, the good news is this, the, the new webmaster who started this is actually starting to help work with Chuck to get our new website up and going. So Chuck's got a, a, a little work ahead of him to get our own new website. And it's a different um, program that runs the website behind it. So we're basically uh, starting fresh, I'll say. Um, NERX was held March 21st to 24th. I did not attend it. I don't know if anybody got to dial into that. That is, The region is going to keep doing two conventions a year, one in person and then one virtually. So this was the virtual one, which should also serve as a six-month warning shot to everybody. <laughs> Ken's over there sweating because he's the chairman of the in-person one that's coming up. Um, and, and Ken will po point to you in a minute to see if you want to talk about it. But um, so the NERX is a pretty good deal. Those do come out on uh, YouTube. So if you just want to search NERX, I'm not sure if they're up there already or not. I don't know how long it takes them to get them up. Yeah. They're up already? Thank you. So if you want to see any of the content there, if you didn't have a chance to dial in live, you can go to YouTube and see that content. 
So I, I think they've been incredibly well done in the past. I didn't see this one, but generally a good a good virtual convention. Um, I will point over here to Ken on who is our chair for the 2022. I guess once every 10-ish years or so, the Nutmeg gets uh, the honor and privilege to host the regional convention. I'm trying to promote you here, Ken. Um, but uh, if you anything you want to say, Ken, about the uh, upcoming convention? We had a little bit of error on there when we were trying to sign get the, the kids worked out of the top section sign up between the registrar and the top section coordinator. Um, hopefully, he and I are involved with the LLC, the registrar and I are involved and we can get that up. Uh, we have 14 layouts committed for top section. We have 18 layouts committed for layout visits. Jeff has, at this point, as far as I know, 30, a minimum of 30 clinics committed. Uh, we have a commitment through John for a fan test on the non the pros on Friday, which will include some special mileage and also a shop tour. Um, and I spoke to the lady at the hotel in the winter this week a couple times, and uh, they are excited about us coming back. And they, Jeff, we can't hear the speakers. Yeah, I heard you. Do you want to, could you come up here and, because the microphone is here that people are hearing online. So we have, we, we started this, we started this meeting with nobody online that we now have two people online who can't hear Ken over there. So. Thank you. Well, just I, talk. No, no, I'm done oh. for convention. Oh, okay. They're going to be happy to hear that. <laughs> I have to put my other hat on, okay. and that is my AP hat. Uh, my AP team visited Jeff last Saturday, and we judged his two structures on his lab for structures and his scenery for his scenery AP award. And I would like to present at this time to Jeff Hankey, uh AP Merit Awards for his Structure Fruit Exchange, for his Structure Consumer Fuel, and for his scenic Scenery on Martinsburg, West Virginia. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And just so you know, the two Structure Certificates complete his requirements for his AP Structures Award and the scenery completes his requirements for his scenery AP certificate. So those are in process. I sent them off last weekend. I confirmed that they were received on Monday <laughs> and have been sent national. Now, 
the national procedure is he holds everything until the 25th of the month and then he processes. Okay. So okay. you should see it in the month next month. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Kevin. Thank you. Hopefully the uh, is it Greg and James? No, Greg and uh, Dave. Hopefully you guys can hear uh, uh, Ken when he stood up by the microphone. But thank you. I appreciate that, Ken. Uh, yes, right. thank you. Okay, so another thing we uh, like to people know is uh, membership. Membership is actually up. It was in the 150s before. It's 168. I don't know if that's just a bunch of people decided to finally pay their dues because we had a bunch of people in that 30 to 60 day soon to be expired and expunged and never to be spoken of again uh, era. So I think maybe those people got in and actually put the paycheck in. Um, but what's really interesting for me and what I think of is not only membership going up, but a sign that like a think things are going in the right direction is way down at the bottom, I always briefed that we had two open positions, clinic coordinator and social media. But we actually found somebody who found us, Mike Wheeler, who's in the room here, and is going to come up and introduce himself uh, to be our social media uh, coordinator, which if you didn't know, we have a Facebook page and we have a YouTube page and any other one we want to establish. We can we can go establish them, but I'm going to give Mike the reins of that and let him handle that because if you saw us struggling with trying to just work free conference call this morning, you know I'm not the IT guy. So come, you want to stand up, Mike? Come up to the podium here so people can hear you. Um, Mike's got a couple introduction slides of who he is. And we'll see if we can him around. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm 34. I live in Tallinn. Um, by trade, I'm actually a mechanical engineer of 12 years, so working in wind power, mine equipment, uh, currently in life sciences. I am a model railroader since five, since I was given a, uh, remember the old cheapo lifelike train sets, I got one of those for Christmas, and uh, have been involved since. Um, primarily, I'm in HO scale, so a uh, fan of like Burlington Northern, Rock Island, uh, Clinchfield, kind of the uh, 70s and 80s, you know, those railroads. Um, all kind of interests there, so Alco, snow plows in particular, maintenance away, vehicles, critters, weathering. Um, I've also kind of gotten into O and 30 in the last couple of years because of uh, my fiance and I live in a small house, so not much room right now. But there's a new house in the works with a much bigger basement and a lot of ideas going. Um, as far as down there, uh, no. as far as the virtual media lead. Um, one of the things that if, uh, any of you are very social media active, you'll see on Facebook, you'll see on Instagram, there's a lot of activity, not just um, with photos, but a lot of posts about activities and cross-promoting. Um, there, You'll see a lot of uh, flyers. If you've ever been to train shows like what we have here, you'll see the flyer posted on Instagram, you'll see them posted on Facebook. You'll see coverage in video form of conventions and meetings and stuff like that. I think that's a healthy way that we can cross promote between us, between the hub division and the Metro North and get a lot of people uh, involved in what we're doing here. Um, and then the other aspect that I would love to do is if you follow like I don't know, classic trains, for example, they do stuff like F unit Friday, front end Friday. Um, everybody here is doing a lot of great work modeling wise. Let's promote that. Let's let uh, potential members see what it, uh, can be done, what skills you can learn when you work with us, when you work and come and pay attention to these clinics. So, uh, you know, let's promote the good work that we can do and do together. We get everybody involved, get more members here. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, finances uh, went up too. I mean, and everything's going up. Membership's going up, bank account's going up. Got uh, $135 in donations and the regional distribution. Uh, all the communication things are up to date, just so you know. The, the biggest one is the website that's in flux, but all the other things are are, uh, are are up to date if any of you want to go out there and check out. And I did remember to start the recording on this one. If anybody watched the one from last time, I think I got 25 minutes into it before I remember to hit the record button, but this one is recording from the beginning. Uh, so those are good. I think we, got, uh, we do still have uh, a, an open uh, position Secretary James does both of them, and then the other one, let me go back here, was the clinic coordinator. So um, we kind of struggle every time to do to find clinics, find people to do clinics. We all kind of 
roll up our sleeves and find somebody to do one. But um, if anybody wants to be the clinic coordinator for the division, I, I would appreciate that. Please talk to me afterwards. And then the secretary, so that uh, James doesn't have to do both finance and, and secretary would be nice. I think this is my last slide for the division business. Uh, foot, foot stomping the convention that Ken said, those are the dates. And then the calendar, we are in the annual meeting today, but we got uh, four other ones uh, throughout the year. We haven't started really talking about it yet with uh, you know James, but last year we did the December meeting as a, a layout tour instead of an actual meeting here because uh, being the holiday season uh, it seemed to work out really well. We might might kick around the idea of doing that again, but that's that's still on the horizon. We're still what uh, eight months away from that. We got time. Okay, so we're going to take a, a quick break. We usually take like a five minute break if anybody wants to do it, and we'll set up for the first clinic, which is James. He's going to give uh, give his clinic, and I got to do some uh, clicks here to get you sharing. So, but we'll take five minutes. Everybody wants to get up, hit the restroom, recharge your coffee, and we'll get back. It's a minute. Mike, why doesn't that why doesn't that go to switch presenters? Well, let's do it after. Yeah, I don't want to do it now. I'm going to screw the whole thing up. You know that. Come on. Give it to me and we're going to screw the whole thing up. No. Um, you guys are all excited. Look at you. You're like, hey, look. You guys know what they're doing. So it's all working. You're going to stand here and do it? And you got a clicker? I'm going to check one thing. we got a quick break here. Jeff, this is Dave Ackman. Just wondering if you could hear me. I'm sorry, someone's talking? Yeah, this is Dave Ackman. Just wanted to make sure you could hear me. Just an audio check. I can hear you, Dave. Yep. Terrific. I'll mute again. So, so that Dave or whoever else is on mic can see you, you're going to be you're on my, my you're on my phone. So okay, I'm right here. You just if you uh, yeah. well, it's one you got it. So you can choose your screen as you want. Yep. Word document. And the video works. I can see you. I do. It's on. Yes, please. There we go. Okay. Okay. I'm used to standing in front. Okay, now I'm going to stop looking at the hard side of the bottom. 
get started with James Clinic on building a retractable train brake. Everybody start finding their seats. Good morning, gentlemen. Right. I know. No, I, I, no, I don't. So anyway. I try to be nice to them because it's like it's a Saturday morning. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, Good morning, and uh, this is this is the test run because this is a, a brandy new clinic. I haven't given this one before, so this this is this is the test drive. This is one of the uh, clinics that I plan to present at the convention. Um, so I don't have the handouts ready yet. Everything is still in in the works. So building retractable train brake. When you have next slide. When you have a, a train and you're trying to it, you have a grade, like on my railroad, um, I have a helix, and then the layout is mostly on a grade, so it's like one of those no leaks, it's both. So uh, between each town, there's always a grade. And you know, the wheel chocks will work great, these little, that little yellow thing right there. If you have one or two cars, that's great. But if you have six or eight, you know, and it's, you know, you have the train hanging down on a 2% grade, it's, you know, it's not going to stay. You're going to be chasing that thing down. So I'm going like, there's got to be a better way. How else can I do this? And me being a mechanical guy, I like, you know, good mechanical things. Next. So here we go. I got a whole string of cars and a uh, whole string of paint cars here. And they're going downhill. <clears throat> and without this brake, I'll be chasing those down into the staging yard. Not fun. So, next slide. Yep, I need to come up with a better solution and something that is, um, you know, sturdy. You know, something robust. Because I, my railroad is built for operations and, you know, some people aren't as delicate as others when it comes to working things. Now, that and you find that found that out uh, at nine years in the Navy. Nothing is sailor proof, so I tend to build things rather robustly. Because um, if it's going to break, it's going to be when somebody else works it. So I build things rather robust. So let's. I need a better solution than that wheel chalk. They work great on on low grades, but not this one's going almost going into. 2%. So, next slide. 
So this is what I came up with. Just a little piece of wire. Seems real simple. Little piece of wire up up between the up between the uh, the ties. That'll hold it really well. But let me show you how I built it. Next. Cray break. This is my least the list of materials and all the tools that it, tools that I used. Um, not all of them are pictured. Uh, but I, I used a lot of number eight because that's what I had, number eight fittings, that's because that's what I had on hand. Um, I've done it before where I've done quarter 20 because I had lots of quarter 20 threaded rod and whatnot. But that, this is what I had. Next. And there's most of the, most of my fittings. That's what I used. Open up the drawer, pull things out. I only had to buy a couple of things because I ran out. Next. All right. <clears throat> I had a uh, five millimeter plywood hanging around from other projects. So break out the trusty table saw and I ripped the, ripped the, these four inches wide. These are going to be the, uh, the bases. Next. Then I cut these into squares. These are, here we go. I'm going to undo these. So these are all my, my squares after they've been cut. You know, I'm, I built. I had to build two of them for my for my railroad. And since this is a presentation, I have two mock-ups that I had to build, and then all the steps to build. So I built a whole lot. I built a whole lot of these. Um, when I originally built these first for my layout, I I think I built like six of them. So. You know, I was building these in batches anyway, then it makes it easier. Once once you're set, if you're setting up for one, you might as well set up for like for a dozen. It's just fine. Next. Okay, now the other strip on the table saw ripped it because that's going to be for the sides of the base and also the, the actuator arm. So for yep for bigger applications. There they are. Next. All right. Now I chopped everything into into blocks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I didn't show the radial arm saw because, well, you know, for one thing, I don't 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 recommend drinking. Please don't. No alcohol when you're working with power tools. That's why I have all my fingers, and I didn't take pictures with it because I like having fingers attached and I want to keep them that way. So. Everything's just shown on my table saw, but uh, they were cut, cut. I cut these on a radial arm saw. You can use a shop saw, or you can uh, use whatever you have. Use whatever you have. Just takes a little longer. Next. All right. <clears throat> now I've uh, marked these up. Going to take the square. It's going to make two bases. And that's square in the middle, that's two triangles. That's going to be a smaller actuator arm. And then they just notch a cut, uh, notch some along the side because I'm going to need it for clearance. Um, I, so I mark these all up for, uh, before I cut them. Next. All right, I made the diagonal cuts on the four inch square. You know, notch the, the sides. Did that on the radial arm saw also? Um, yeah, and the, the the triangle on the on the base is going to be cut with the with a hand saw. So it's not very big. Next, there we go. See that centerpiece there? I try to I try to save it, it being being frugal. Or can I ask my kids I'm cheap. Um, I try to I try to uh, use as much material as possible, so I, I don't want things to go to waste. But that centerpiece can be used, say, if you need something with a shorter throw, like say if you're going to use this in an end scale application, the the, the throw will be shorter, and you can use get away with smaller material. Next, all right, using the handsaw. On this five millimeter uh, plywood, 
right? Put it in a vise, cut it, and I had to inch it up so the uh, so the plywood doesn't vibrate, and then it splitters all over the place, and then it's like you got to throw it away because it's all splintered. It's no good. It's not going to be structurally sound. So um, it took a little while, but uh, yeah, it's going to work. Next, please. There we go. Move it up a little bit. Come down. Um, do, 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 do. Too much. <laughs> too much verbiage in there. Okay, next. Okay, after those are all cut, I'm going to drill, drill the holes. I put the holes on on each piece. You can untape those if you want. But they're just taped together for for me to keep them or keep it organized. Because this is going to be um, your pivot point for your actuator arm. And also while I was drilling, I um, pre-drilled the holes for the nails for uh, wire nails, but don't drill all the way down. Is if you're drilling into the side of the plywood without pre-drilling it, you will split it. So just, uh, the nails are just there to, to, for the shear force. The glue is what holds it together. The, uh, the wire nails are just there for if there happens to be any shear forces. It'll uh, it's a bit stronger than the glue. Next, all right, we go. Put put a bit of glue in there, nailed it on. I put those. That's all pushed in by hand, and then I take a, a tack hammer and just give it a little tap tap, and they're all nice and um, nice and set. Um, no, I didn't use a nail set on these, but so you don't have to push the the, the nail hole in. And I let these sit for a day. Next, so let the let. Oh, there we go. Nails are all in place. Like I said, I'm doing a whole bunch of them. And uh, glue them up, go down there, you know, and let them dry for a day. You know, if you happen to be one of those people that or that do the, you know, work on your railroad an hour a day thing, this is great. Go down there, do a little job. Not only that, the day will let your either paint dry, your glue dry, whatever you need to. Done. Okay. This is. Next. All right, on the base plate, I drilled three holes on these, even because you know, when I go to put it on the railroad, a lot of times underneath, you can only get two holes, but you don't know which ones you're going to get. So it goes up. So there are three holes. And I also uh, pre-drilled the holes to put the, uh, the sides onto the base plate. Next. Here we go. Uh, the wire nails again, glue pushed in uh, the sides of the base plate. Glue it up, let it dry overnight. Next. Now we're going to our actuator to the actuator arms. With the with the holes drilled. Now the smaller one, the triangle one, um, in a lot of cases it, it, it ended up not having uh, enough throw for the um, for for HO, so it probably worked with pretty good for N because I tried <clears throat> measuring the ones that I built before. I unfortunately didn't keep the plans for them. I didn't build, yeah, the one time that I need to rebuild something, I don't keep the plans. Yeah, so I had to go underneath the layout and try measuring something, laying on my back, trying to measure things. So I thought this was going to work, and it didn't. So I had to come up with a with a bigger one. So next, here we go. Now, 
why why was this why would this one not have enough throw than this one? And it's the relation between the pivot your pivot hole here and the hole ooh, that one fell, that fell out. Uh, and the hole for your throw rod. The the larger the distance between those two holes will give you a bigger throw, it give you a longer throw. So that they have the relation there. Okay, next. Okay, your other hole here is that's where your input shaft is going to be. So this is this this hole here is for for the thrust that's going to push the the rod up. And the distance between the your input shaft hole and your your um, input shaft hole. Pivot point and impact. The input shaft and pivot point. The bigger you can make that, the more thrust you're going to have, the more force you're going to have. So if um, you have a long distance, to, if you're doing this a long distance, you'll be able to push that. Next. All right, here we go. We're going to start. We're going to start uh, assembling the hardware. Okay, um, these are the eyes. These are going to be. Here's one of them. Okay, With the, we're going to start assembling where um, the input shaft is. These are uh, by bolts. Don't get the screws. Screws are for the wood. These are bolts. And the. Uh, there are two nuts just jammed together, so they stay put. Next. Oop. There we go. Hmm. Okay. Huh? That is the next slide. Okay. All right. This is all put together. So you, you take the take your rifle with your two nuts. Washer goes on either side of the actuator arm. And um, next, and on the other side, what we're going to look next. There we go. And on the other side, you get a locking nut. That's those are the nuts that are taller that have the, the nylon on the inside, so they don't back out. And you can adjust them and you put a, a, a washer here. So what this hat, what this does, right? What, so what this does is <clears throat> this will spin. It, it's not really loose. You want, when you put all this together, you want there to be some resistance. You don't want it all locked up. So. So these these can spin. Next. Yeah, after it's together you put the where's that water? There we go. Your actuator rod. It's just a uh peak. I'm using uh thirty two thousand phosphor bronze wire. Uh, I've used forty in the in the uh in the past, but unfortunately Mr. Tishy was not at Springfield this year, so I didn't get to clean him out of fossil bronze wire and windows and all that other stuff. So, um, so I had I was out of 40, so I had to use 32. And this is just held. This will be held in. There we go. And this is going to be. Just so it swings freely. Next. All right. How how the actuator arm is attached is important because there are two ways this this can can work. You can either have the normal position, which is on mine, it, it's pushed in. It can either be you can either have the wire up or the wire down. Is your normal position. So, 
And how you put your put that actuator on on depends on whether the normal is up or the normal is down. And this is showing normal on on my railroad where it's pushed in. Next. Okay, excuse me. Okay, normal position if it's if it's uh, yeah. The normal position on the train brake is down. I mean that that is you can have trains run over it and run over that section of track and they'll go just fine. Nothing will stop. But when you want to um, set the brake, you pull the knob and the wire comes up. When you do that, okay, the throw rod hole has to be below the pivot point in re in relation to the bottom of the rail. So. So when the when it's pushed in, your your throw rod is going to be the, the longest underneath the the railroad. And I have two examples here of that if you want to check them out. Next. Now here's uh, <clears throat> here is it set up on where the normal position would be up. So that that's um, I can use it for either. If it's on an industry siding that has a bit of a grade, uh, instead of setting that, the, the handbrake or the wheel brake on the on the cars, this is up. Or if you can use it instead of uh, a derailleur, it'll keep cars go, from going out into uh, on the main line. So it's up, and the normal position is up, which means the throw rod hole is above your pivot point. Next. All right, the actuator arm. Put the actuator arm on. I had um, the snow bolt. That's just what I had. They were a lot longer. They could have gotten shorter, but that's what I had in the box. And I put two flat washers in between the side and the actuator arm to to um, so there'd be enough lack of friction. Everything could move nicely. Because if there was only one washer, you, you, what would happen is you would wear out one of the pieces of wood. It'll get a hole, and next thing you know, the thing's all sloppy. So if you use two washers, the washers can rub up against each other. Yeah, and there's one washer on either side, and there's the locking nut again. Another one of those that you want it snug, you want it to move, but you don't want it to flop around. Just enough resistance, you know. So you know, if you if you you pull it out, it's going to stay. Okay. Next. Yeah, this is the fun part. Get to attach it to, you know, lucky me, I got to attach them to an already built railroad. Fun. No, uh, this is much easier to do if you happen to not have your scenery foam down. Uh, that was the case when I built the other ones, but not this time. So all the, all the wires run. <laughs> the scenery's up, so the scenery foam is in. So I'm up there carving, spitting <laughs> spitting foam out of out of my mouth and blinking it out of my eyes. Even though I have glasses, yeah, yep. Yeah. So what you have to do is figure out where you want your rod to come up out of the railroad. And then figure out is there anything that's going to be in my way underneath. So, but you screw, you fish the fish the rod up, and uh, find a try to find at least two two screws to to land the assembly. Next. All right, this, this is showing one of the mock-ups that I made. Because I already had the scenery and the fascia up, so I couldn't use uh, my railroad as an example. But on here, I have there's an there's an eye screw that's used as a stop on the way out. If you if you pull it out, it has a stop. I mean, you could you could not use this, but I'd rather not stress the wood because if you're using the actuator as your stops, it, it'll put uh, stress on all mechanisms, 
So you want stop, stops made. You want hard stops, hard mechanical stops. So you're not using 100% of the, the action in your mechanism. So those are um, just two screws and a couple of, couple of washers. It takes some fiddling around to, to, uh, to put them together. Next. There we go. That's a stop assembly. Here we go. It all, that's all it is. It's a nice screw to stop it. Next. And th this is uh, the actuator arm. This is how it's assembled on the uh, the throw the throw the actuator arm itself. Here we go. So it's got nuts, washers, and the locking nut. And yeah, you adjust that to where when when your uh, the knob on the on the fascia is all the way in because you want the the fascia's the knob on the fascia is going to be your other stop. So that use the nuts and the threaded rod so it you know you you can fine tune it. Next, there we go. It's, that's how I set up uh, the other stop when it when it's uh, activated. There we go. Next. All right. You have the throw the throw rod is up. It, you know it was whatever size rod I happen to have, and it's really really too uh, tall. So I just got a wheel set. Uh, all I want are these to just catch catch the axles. I. You, Use only 33 inch wheels on my on my railroad. All the cars have 33 inch wheels. That's it. Everybody, everything does. Just making everything standard. So if I have to change, if I have to, you know, change a wheel set because you know wheel got funky or something, um, I'm, everything's the same. I don't have to worry about it. Cuts down on inventory. But I, this is this is in the on position. And you take the take the wheel set, and you just snip the snip the rod to height. Okay. Next. All right. There we go. Yellow paint. Does you want to see it? Be able to see it. Um, you know, yellow yellow is always good. That's what it is. Get a little yellow paint. There it is. And a little brush. Next. Okay. Now. I had this happen a couple of times. It's like I didn't have a nice clear shot from where the this where the train brake is. I had to go around. I don't know. Let me see. What did I have to go around? I had I had obstacles. I had to go around. Yeah, it, it could it could be a leg, or uh, there was one case where it's all the way over there, and there's you know way too. Or it was a, a curve. There was a, that's right. It was a curve in the fascia. So I had to change directions. And, and the way to do that is you make you make a pivot for it. And really quick on how we did that, uh, how I did that. Yeah, this is this is an assembly that I made. Yeah, this is an older one because that's there's quarter twenty in that. Okay, next. Here we go. We're gonna make an we're gonna make the the pivot assembly. Easy peasy. You know, same way. Um, the base is the base is thicker because I have to hide the, the head of the screw, and everything else is the normal hardware that uh, other hardware that we've used for uh, the previous steps. Next. Yep. There are the three eighths inch plywood that I've used because that was also. I have to have a lot of that because that's what I use for my sub-row bed is 3 8 inch plywood. So I had lots of that kicking around. And everything's marked up to for drilling. Next. All right. I had to find the bottom. This, is, this also attaches to the bottom of the layout. I had to recess that. I had to make a recess for that hole. There are two ways to do it. You can either use a foster bit or uh, a, a spade bit. Next. And those are okay. Wood board. They're also called spade bits, but yeah, 
those are those are the difference. The Forster bit has a nice flat bottom and it gives it a, a, a much cleaner cut. The wood boring bit, not so much. Uh, but those are that's the difference. I had to add the Forster bit for another project, so that's the one I use. Yay! I <laughs> I don't know how many tools I bought for. I bought this tool for one project that it collects dust. Who uses a timing light? Yes, I still have a timing light. Uh, okay, next. All right, the the, the standoff. There we go. The, your, is um, a, a stove bolt and washers. That's it. Make sure everything is tight, tight on these. You don't want this. You don't want this to flop around. It's not going to work. Next. This is all put together, all nice and pretty. Um, your eye bolts are uh, put on the same way as the others, just snug. You want them to move, but you don't want much resistance. Next. And there it is, attached with the, the throw rods. One of those rods are going to the going to the station, the other one's going to your uh, actuator assembly. It's fun working upside down. Next. That's it. Questions? Yes, Ken. Yes. Yes. Well, you could use you could use uh, thicker plywood. I wouldn't go thinner. Or. I wouldn't use styrene. Uh, styrene probably wouldn't take the abuse. Of the, uh, styrene wouldn't you take the? I don't think it would take the abuse of all of um, of just the operation. I don't believe it. That that still wears out rather easily. I mean, you could you can try, but uh, to get the equivalent strength, you probably have to go a lot thicker on that. Um, I mean, if I if I really wanted to go nuts, I could have made this out of aluminum. So, <laughs> but but I'd rather not. Uh, I happen to have the wood on hand. It's relatively inexpensive, and, it, and the thing is, wood is quick to work with. And this all can be done with hand tools. Can be done with hand tools. I used a lot of power tools because I have them. So, but they can be done with hand tools, and you know, works for. Works rather well. Some of those have been on the I've they've been on the railroad for I think about five years, working just fine. Yes, but you'd you'd have to you'd have to support that better. Um, I can go as far as well. One of those, the, the one picture that shows where I used the quarter twenty rod. I think I had a, I think I had two feet of throw, so I could act, use that without the, the quarter twenty flop around too much. That's, I think that's why I didn't go with the number eight or number ten throat, threaded rod because at that length it starts flopping around a lot, and with uh, the shielded cable, uh, it, it needs a lot of support. So it, it has a tendency to, to flop around. So that's why I didn't use that. I like the threaded rod because it's right, it, it it doesn't flex as it doesn't flex as easy as. I mean, it can be it can be used, but I I used what I had on hand. I didn't have to buy that much extra material. It, this is just. A lot of this is made over, made from leftover materials from other projects. Because if I was going to use that, I'd have to buy it. And then good luck trying to, you know, get it. Well, I wouldn't say good luck. It's it's harder to work with if you have to cut it to size. But I'm sure it could be done. Anybody else? Yes. Oh.
No. No. It, it once it's retract once it's retracted. Well, like it, yes, it can. It can uh, it can catch on. And any it'll catch on anything that's below your below your axle height. Anything below there, it'll catch on. I cut it so in it. I cut it to catch the catch the axles. That's what because that's the what will take um, the most most strain on the car. You don't want to catch some underbody detail. So when you're when you're using this, you do want to try to line it up to your couple uh, to your to your trucks, not your couple. Sorry, but you know when it's down, it's it, it's going to be at least below the rail head, uh, below the rail head. It could. Um, yeah, it can. It has. It, it, um, yeah, you, you, you can put it off center. I put, I put it just, these just happen to line up on center. Um, yeah, because they just happen to line up on center. And, um, you know, it, it'll catch underbody details. It'll catch the coupler. Yeah, it'll hold that. Now, because, um, you know, when people when people are operating, because that's what this you know, my railroad is built for operations, and you know, not everybody's you know, you know when when they're operating, they're focusing on I need to get this done. It's like okay, here's the train brake. I make my cut where I need to, and you activate the brake. You pull it up. Now, if it happens to be in the middle of the car and it's a and, and it's a uh, a, a bottom empty hopper. If it catches the, you know, catches some of the underside. Yeah, it does. That's what happens. That, huh? Oh, should be. Should should be, yeah, should be, but you know, it depends on the car. Okay, anybody else? Got Tom. a question. I'm sorry, I need to make them bigger, huh? The color. It's the color. Color and the background. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll I'll work on that. I'm going to have to redo this, so I know I know it's going to have to. So, yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Okay, comic sans it is. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why that's why I'm doing here. So Okay. Because I you you and I talked about them before we looked at them before the Okay. I think it's their system when it walks up in there. Right. No. Good. That's 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 why I'm doing it here. No, good. That's good. And I changed the name of my company. Yeah, that's fine. Good. Yes, Don. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh well. I still have I still have all the parts. So yes, I can do this. Yes. Um, Show what you're doing first, then show how to 
do it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. When 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 whoever when whoever's operating when they end up you know derailing the car and dump it over on you know dumping it on its side it's like yeah okay. Okay, we'll do. Oh, don't worry. I've shamed people that have derailed on my on, on my layout. <laughs> Oh wait, he's not here today. <laughs> John. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's another thing for my operator to screw up. I, I've, you know, I've had other ones. You know, they've been working fine on the railroads. Whenever they, you know, they're been a fault, it has been operator error. Um, but that's okay. I, I have my camera. I have my, I have my phone with me or my camera with me when we have off session. So yes, if somebody screws up, yes, I do take pictures. Ah. Oh yeah. So. One more. I would just like that, that I would invite everybody up to your thing and let them actually operate it. Then it would be a lot easier to operate it. Then, in other words, you're going to get the clinic you've got those two displays on. Invite everybody up to actually work it. And then that's exactly what you're talking about. Yes. Um, I, I would have done that, except. To give the clinic, we're also doing it virtually, so I have to be here, even though most of the time my head was no doubt cut off. So all they saw was beard and t-shirt, so they, they saw the good part of me. <laughs> okay, I have a face made for radio, right? That's that's the joke, right? I have a face made for radio. Okay, if that right. is it, thank you very much. And yes, then I have question. two examples here, one where the normal is up and one where the normal is down. Uh, go ahead, play with them. Thank you very much. There's a couple of changes I got to make before we get Dave up and running. So, take five minutes here. Dave, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Where's uh, Where's Ron? Ron, can you do me a favor? He's talking. Do you have this? Do you have your speaker? I, I'm, no, no, no. I'm thinking your speaker's going to be louder than mine. Maybe. Hey, Dave, talk again, would you? Testing one, two, three, four. Can you see my screen now? I can. Hey. Huh? I'm, 
because Ron usually has a speaker. Yeah, an external speaker or turn your audio up as high as you can on your on your PC. That's why I'm curious if we, if we want to. I'm maximum volume on my thing here. Is your volume? Turn your speakers up. You're maxed up. Let me, let me, let me, let me yeah. uh, mute. Okay. Go ahead and say something else, Dave. Test. Okay, I'm going to actually start playing this to make sure that uh, my computer that's, audio that's works through. That's better. We'll keep keep your setting. Whatever you got set, leave it. All right, Dave. We're just going to give uh, two minutes. To let everybody come back in. All right. All right. Uh, give me three. I'm going to make a bio break. I think. Uh, See how I make your. Oh, Dave, that's Dave's screen, so Dave has to maximize his own. This is Dave's back. I'll be with you in about two minutes. wants to start. Thank you. 
Let's be online first. Uh, somebody else bought this. You can get the hard copy if you want. Also, that's an additional $30. So that's whatever you want to do on that. Volume up so we can hear Dave talk. All right, maybe you should call. Good. Thank you. You all good? Yeah, just looking for So, everybody, uh, wow, I guess that's because I'm talking. Okay. So, uh, everybody, we have uh, D Dave Ackman, who is uh, from Missouri. He's here again giving us a clinic. If you guys saw the Arduino ones before, uh, this one is going to be on uh, making billboards. So we do appreciate uh, Dave volunteering to do this clinic again. Again, virtual world here allows us to get a clinician that's nowhere even near the state of Connecticut. So appreciate Dave uh, joining us again, and he'll he'll give his uh, his brief. And I'll ask you now, Ron, to turn the volume. I will let you hear my thoughts. Uh, okay. If I knew how to do that, I would. Go ahead, David. Sorry. Sound check. How's this coming through? Hopefully you can hear me now. All right. Can you see my screen there with my website on it? I cannot hear any comment back, so... Yes, we can. Sorry. I have to All check. right. 
Mm-hmm. All right, sounds like we're, we're good to go. Well, thank you. I'm Dave Ackman from the Gateway Division NMRA in St. Louis, and I'm here to tell you uh, a little bit about how I've been building billboards for my railroad, the Baden, Vote, and Dismet. And they teach you in speech class sometimes to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So I'm going to do that for a little bit. I'm going to tell you the three main points you all should get out of this clinic. Number one, right now you're looking at my website. So if you write nothing else down, write down this web address. And it's going to come back a couple of times during the clinic. Uh, HTTP colon slash slash D-A-A-C-K-M dot github, G-I-T-H-U-B dot I-O, D-A-A-C-K-M dot github dot I-O. Well, why is this important? Well, I teach several clinics, and all of them are documented on this website. And if we scroll down to the very first clinic I ever taught, it's this one. Building Billboards on the Baden, Vote, and Dismet. And if you ever want to play this thing back again, uh, the complete presentation is here. All you got to do is click on it. If you want to just see a a 90-second overview, it's here. There's a handout. Uh, There's information on how I build assembly fixtures. That's going to be important at the end. So everything is documented here on this clinic and all the ones that I have ever taught. So that's uh, a place to go for information. Okay, we're going to minimize that right now, and we're going to start the clinic. Uh, The three things that are the most important that you're about to see, the website address, I'm going to emphasize standardizing on certain sizes of billboards. Because if you just build one billboard, that's fine. But if you want to duplicate it the next time, you're really going to want to work with standardized sizes and not try to make uh, all sorts of things ad hoc every time, because that's a waste of time. So I try to make my billboards uh, eight scale feet tall in HO, or 10, or 12, or 14 or 16. I don't try any 9s. I don't try any 11s. I've standardized on 8 through 16 uh, in in HO scale. Uh, And when I did that, that brings us to point number three. I'd use gauge blocks, and we'll talk about what those are, and assembly fixtures. And it makes making these things so much easier. So website, standardized size, and use gauge blocks and fixtures for assembly, and that's going to make things uh, a lot easier. Those are the three main points. Now, I'm going to run a video here. Uh, It's all in the can, but I'm going to stop it from time to time and make some comments, and if there are some questions as we go along, well, we can take them then, or we can uh, wait to the end. So I'm going to roll tape. Here we go. welcome you to this series of videos on the creation of billboards and posters for model railroads. My railroad is the Baden, Boat, and Dismet, the names of the elementary schools I attended back in the 1950s. Like many railroads, I have a small carnival, but one day I decided the circus should come to town. I wanted circus billboards. I went to look at Hey Dave, is there any way to increase your volume? Is the audio going to work, guys? We barely hear it. Dave, Dave, we can hear you perfectly, but the video audio. Okay, what I'm going to try here. Uh, since it's not coming through this way, I'm going to alter some uh, parameter here. Hang on. I'm going to send it through my microphone. Uh, seems like we're having a little bit of problem here. I'm going to rerun it here from the beginning. And uh, when you hear it, could you let me know if this is an improvement? I will. 
No improvement. Is it an improvement? No. Okay, hang on. How about now? That is better. Okay. I'm going to let it run here and uh, we'll get it going. Hello, I am Dave Ackman, and I want to welcome you to this series of videos on the creation of billboards and posters for model railroads. My railroad is the Baden, Vote, and Dismet, the names of the elementary schools I attended back in the 1950s. Like many railroads, I have a small carnival, but one day I decided the circus should come to town. I wanted circus billboards. I went looking for them on the web, but found nothing that met my needs. But I did find many circus images, just not billboards, so I decided to make them myself. One thing led to another, and I created over a hundred billboards for various products and industries that I remember while growing up. Now my goal is to share with you the techniques I have uncovered to create unique billboards which complement the industries on your layout and the products they produce. To meet this goal, I will demonstrate how to search for, organize, and save vintage billboards and poster images how to size and print the cows for billboards you have saved, how to build supporting structures to display your decals, and how to build fixtures to help build the structures. In order to complete your billboards, you will need access to several items, a personal computer running Microsoft Windows and a high-speed internet connection, an inkjet printer, I use a Canon MG2520 available for about $75. Decal paper. I use white water slide decal transfer paper at about $18 for 20 sheets. A styrene chopper 3 from Northwest Short Lines, about $42 or its equivalent. Digital or dial calipers a height gauge like a Wixie WR200 or equivalent, brass setup gauge blocks, a ruler in HO scale, and various pieces of evergreen styrene. A plank of 48 inch, 3 quarter inch, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Pieces of brass rod, MDF, Corian, or other dimensionally stable material. And 3 by 5 index cards. Throughout these tutorials, we will provide dimensions for creating billboards for images between 8 and 16 feet tall in HO scale. However, the techniques are applicable to larger and smaller scales. First, I decided to visit the Walters website and search for ready-made billboards, and I found over 70 options in HO. But of these, over 50 were from Tishy and I felt they were rather plain, and none featured a circus. Walters themselves offered some pre-made support structures that matched the artwork appearing in their annual catalog, and although I did like them, there was little variety in the artwork, and there was no way to have billboards at any dimension other than the one they offered. I then searched YouTube and found one good site that showed how to construct custom billboards from styrene, and I liked his approach. You can find it yourself if you search for Luke Towen Billboard. But finally, I decided that if I was to get my circus billboards, I would have to build them from scratch. But where could I find the circus billboard artwork that I remembered? As a retired computer scientist, I decided to do a search on the Internet. I typically use Firefox as a browser and Yahoo for searches. I did a search on Vintage Images Circus, and I hit the mother load. At the very top was a link to a site featuring circus images, so I clicked on it. I scrolled to the top and saw the first of many, many images one of which was enlarged.
The enlarged image was not particularly useful to me, but then I started paging downward. Quickly, I found an image that met my needs, so I clicked on it. An enlargement appeared, which also gave the dimensions of the image in pixels. I decided to save the image to my hard drive. I right-clicked on the image, and a menu popped up. One of the options was to save image as. I clicked on this option, and a file save window opened. I decided to create a folder for all my future circus images, so I clicked on the New Folder button in the upper left, navigated to a place I liked, named the folder Circus, then double-clicked on it to open it. I then gave the image a name and clicked on Save. This completed the capture of the image on my hard drive to use as I desired. I continued scrolling down until I reached the end of the page, where a Show More Images button appeared. I clicked on it, and more and more images appeared. When I found something new I liked, I right-clicked on it and saved it. This continued until I had enough. I ended up with 35 images suitable for billboards or posters. I was very pleased. But this was just the beginning. I realized that I could combine vintage images with any broad topic for which I wanted a billboard. Cars, soft drinks, groceries, tobacco, anything that stirred my mind could be memorialized into a billboard. I subsequently searched vintage billboard instead of vintage images and found even more. The fun never ends. Before we go any further, let's consider how tall the artwork for a billboard should be. I thought there might be some industry standards for billboard artwork, but in searching, I found none. So, for my railroad, I decided that I would standardize on artwork height of 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16 scale feet. After a bit of experience, I found myself rarely using the larger sizes, generally using the 8 foot size and occasionally the 10 foot height. 8 feet translates into 96 inches, and in H of scale, after we divide 96 by the HO scale factor of 87.1, we find that artwork 8 feet tall translates into 1.09 actual inches, which I often round to 1.10 inches. A 10-foot piece of billboard art would translate into 120 inches, and when divided by the scale factor of 87.1, results in 1.38 actual inches, and so on. Standardizing on one or two sizes of artwork for your railroad will make creating support structures easier, and I strongly suggest you limit the size of your billboard projects as well. When you find an image you like, take a look at its size. This calliope is 1,200 pixels wide and 973 pixels tall. By default, this image will print at 300 pixels per inch, resulting in a default image size of 4 inches wide and 3.24 inches tall, much too large for an HO scale billboard. No matter, we can scale it down in PowerPoint, and even if we scale it down by a factor of 3 to fit an 8-foot billboard, the image will still look fine. But what if the image was smaller? say only 100 pixels tall. Such an image would need to be enlarged to fit our needs, and enlargements generally appear pixelated or choppy, and we should avoid such images. Generally, you need about 100 pixels per inch to get a good piece of billboard art. So an image for an 8-foot billboard needs to be at least 110 pixels tall before reduction. A 10-foot piece of art, at least 140 pixels, and so on. I did discover that some of the images were copyrighted, but I believe that if used on my personal railroad for educational purposes, then the fair use doctrine of copyright law allows me to use them. Also, as the use is very limited, 
I believe the de minimis doctrine in which the law does not concern itself with trifles applies. I certainly would not sell any images I captured, but I believe that I am free to use them on my model train layout. If you have further concern, of course, consult your own counsel. Other images have watermarks imposed on them to protect them from unpaid use, and I tend to avoid them. Here you can see watermarks on a circus image and what it can look like if you have the skills to edit a photo. It's a lot of work. Some other thoughts. You know I encourage the use of folders to hold similar images. If you would like some free software to print all the images in a folder, complete with their file names, I would recommend Image Viewer from http colon slash slash www.faststone.org. It has a nice way of putting multiple images on a single page in a thumbnail format and is quite useful. Also, while I used Firefox and Yahoo, other browsers and search engines will also work. I tested Microsoft Edge and the Google search engine and they worked as well. Your choice. Now that we have our images, how do we turn them into decals? Making decals is easy if you have a good inkjet printer. All you need is special decal paper and some software to scale the images. First, the paper. Decal paper is available at some hobby shops and online. I prefer to buy my decal paper from Amazon as it is less expensive, less than a dollar per A4 size sheet and is delivered directly to my door. Search Amazon for water slide decal transfer paper white and it should pop right up. I like the brand from Rolurius. Their sample image is the one with the purple background. Rolurius also makes a clear decal transfer paper but get the one with the white background. That's why we put white in our search bar. Clear transfer paper might be your choice for numbering rolling stock, but not for posters and billboards. If you have PowerPoint on your PC, you can use it to import size and print your images. If not, consider downloading LibreOffice at www.libreoffice.org. LibreOffice includes a useful presentation program similar to PowerPoint. Click the download button to download the software and save the MSI file. Then double click on the downloaded file and follow the installation instructions. Whether you use PowerPoint or LibreOffice, the tasks we need to make the images printer ready are the same, importing and sizing. I will show how to use both tools. Now, on to importing and scaling with PowerPoint. Our goal is to download and size about a dozen images on a single page. We do so because decal paper is not inexpensive, so we might as well get as much out of the sheet as we can. To import our accumulated images, we open a new blank presentation then click on the border around the click to add title box and then click on the keyboard's delete key to remove it. Similarly, we click on the click to add subtitle boxes border and then hit the delete key to remove it. Now, to import an image, we click on the insert tab and then on the picture icon. A menu window opens and we scroll to select the folder where we placed our images. We then select an image of interest and then the insert button. The image will appear within PowerPoint. To resize the image, we right click on the image and then select size and position. Next, we make sure that the lock aspect ratio box is checked. We enter in the desired height. I hope that you do remember that an eight foot tall billboard translates into 1.10 scale inches and so forth. And then click on the close button. We repeat this process to add more images until our page is full.
And we're doing this because we want to have our standard sizes. Uh, this is uh, these are going to be big enough to be uh, for an eight foot billboard and if we would just printed them out without resizing them well they would have been too big so uh, sizing these images uh, makes them fit the billboard heights of our choice if you do not have PowerPoint LibreOffice as described earlier can do the same task for free Start LibreOffice and click on the Impress Presentation button on the left. The Select a Template window will open, and since we do not want a template, we cancel the window. Now on the right side, in the Properties column, please make sure that the slide format is A4, which is the size of the decal film, and select the first available layout, the blank one at the upper left of the available layouts. To insert our images, we click on the Insert menu item and then on Image. Just like in PowerPoint, a menu window opens and we scroll to select the folder where we placed our images. We then select an image of interest and then click on the Open button, a slight difference from PowerPoint where this button is labeled Insert. Now right click on the image and select Position and Size. We make sure that the Keep Ratio box is checked, enter in the desired height, and then the OK button. We repeat this process to add more images until our page is full. Printing the decal is easy. Just place your decal paper properly in your printer and do a file print. When the page completes printing, be careful to avoid touching the printed area and allow the ink to dry overnight. Not one hour, not two hours, not four hours, overnight. Once the page is dry, remember that inkjet printers use water-soluble ink. And if we tried to use the decals without water protection, we would not be pleased. To correct the issue, go to your automotive paint store and buy a rental can of clear spray lacquer and coat the image. Well, it's actually an acrylic. I went to my paint store and they gave me this rattle can and I spray it on the uh, the paper here, the decal paper after it's dried overnight. And now when I put it in the bath, it'll be protected and won't run off the page. It is an acrylic, it's not a lacquer, uh, but it does work. My decal paper says to coat the images within 24 hours of printing. But be sure to read and follow the manufacturer's directions, both for the decal paper and the lacquer. I generally give the decals a second coat of lacquer and allow 24 hours for final drying. If you feel uncomfortable making decals, it is perfectly acceptable to print on cardstock paper, which is about as thick as an index card, and apply the card to the support structure with rubber cement. It may not be as bright or glossy, but it can work. Making the support structure for billboards involves building three assemblies, the face and frame, the legs, and the boardwalk. Making the decals was pretty easy, but this part is a bit harder, so be patient. Let's start with the face and frame. I like to put a frame around every piece of billboard art. To make a face frame, cut out the decal you wish to use. Also, cut two pieces of Evergreen 8210 about four inches long. Lay the decal on a cutting surface with the two pieces of 8210 on the top. This is the height of the face frame you need to hold both the decal and the frame. Lay a straight edge on the top and scribe a straight line, or a half a dozen lines, across a piece of Evergreen 9040 and snap it off. Similarly, place the two pieces of Evergreen 
Evergreen 8210 on the side of the decal. This marks the length of Evergreen 9040 needed to contain the decal and the frame. Using a straight edge, scribe a line and snap it off. You could use Evergreen 9030 and even 9020, which are progressively thinner and less expensive. But I appreciate the additional heft and I'm willing to pay the price. Your decision. Now it is time to build the frame and we will use a chopper razor blade type cutter or equivalent and some more evergreen number 8210 strips to cut out our parts. Since we just cut the face, I recommend that we place the top of the face frame in the chopper and bring up a stop to set the size of the cut. I cut pieces of brass to serve as stops for right angle cuts, as they are smaller than the triangular stops from Northwest Short Line and easier to use. Cut two pieces to become the top and bottom of the frame, and three more to be used eventually for the boardwalk. While you are at it, cut four pieces of Evergreen 8206 for eventual use as back stiffeners. Similarly, rotate the face and cut two pieces of 8210 to frame the left and right sides. Set aside three pieces of 8210 and all four pieces of 8206. Now, Miter the remaining four pieces of 8210 at 45 degrees, being careful not to snip off too much of the length. Glue the left frame piece to the face, then the top and bottom, and finally the right frame piece. Test fit the decal into the frame and trim if needed. I usually use Plastruct plastic weld or Plastruct bonding glue, but other fast drying brush applied glues will work. Plastic weld has a bit more working time and totally cures in 24 hours, and bonding sets up faster and cures faster. You don't need to be ultra careful with the gluing, as painting will cover a lot of sins. Now, flip the face frame assembly face down, and let's glue some stiffeners to the back for visual interest. In the previous step, we cut four pieces of Evergreen 8206, but something larger or smaller could be substituted. I space them evenly, parallel to the long side of the frame. Now let's go to the boardwalk. Earlier, we cut three pieces of Evergreen 8210 for this purpose. I use a small fixture to line the three pieces parallel, apply some masking tape over all three of them, and then use the tape to remove the strips from the fixture. Every inch or so, I glue some Evergreen 8104 crosswise to brace the main pieces. I then remove the tape and allow the assembly to dry. Once dry, I nip off any excess length of the cross braces. Finally, we need to create several supports to hold the frame and boardwalk. Our supports will have four parts, a vertical leg, a slanted leg, a cross member, and a diagonal support, all constructed from Evergreen 164. Here you may want to diverge from my suggestions. Evergreen 164 is approximately 8 by 8 inches in HO scale, and you may feel that such a piece is a bit larger than prototypical. The billboard frames from Walther's are indeed a bit thinner. But for my eye and fat fingers, 164 is more pleasing and easier to work with. Again, your decision. If you end up wanting to make a lot of signs, you may want to order Evergreen 164 in bulk as part number 6164, directly from the manufacturer at http colon slash slash evergreenscalemodels.com. They're good folks. To assemble the supports, I created a leg assembly fixture out of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, or UHMW for short. UHMW is a very slippery plastic and little sticks to it well, thus making it ideal for an assembly fixture since our glue or glued parts won't stick easily. Yes, you could make an assembly fixture from some other material, but UHMW is ideal easily obtainable, and well worth it. I will describe how to make this fixture in the final part of this tutorial, 
But for now, note that I will be using one fixture to glue the vertical and slanted legs at a 30 degree angle and will then glue the legs to the cross members at a 90 degree angle to the vertical leg, rendering it a horizontal support for the boardwalk. Finally, I will glue the diagonal supports at 60 degrees. Why 30 and 60 degrees? Because I can cut these angles easily on the chopper and they look good. Walters uses these angles for their billboards, so if it is good enough for them, it is good enough for me. So now it is time to cut the legs, but how long? This depends on the height of your artwork and how tall you wish the billboard to be above the ground. Let's assume that the artwork we are using is 8 foot tall. I like to add a frame around the artwork, so that adds another foot above and below the artwork. We are assuming that the legs are 8 foot long, and we also want a toe gap between the face frame and the boardwalk. Adding it all up, it comes to 19 feet for the length of the billboard's front legs. Let's convert 19 feet into inches, and we get 228. Dividing 228 by the HO scale factor of 87.1, that tells us that our front legs should be 2.62 inches long. If you want to use a different height of artwork, or taller or shorter legs, change the numbers and do the math. How many leg sets? I tend to take the width of the face frame assembly, round it up to the next higher whole number, and cut that many leg sets. Thus, if the face frame assembly is between 3 and 4 inches, I use 4 leg sets. If it is between 2 and 3, I use 3 sets. But how long should the diagonal leg be? And you thought you would never use your high school trigonometry. The ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse of a 30 degree angle of a 30-60-90 triangle is the cosine of 30 degrees, or 0 0.866. Thus, the diagonal for the support will be the length of the vertical leg divided by 0 0.866, or 3.02 inches. If you decide to make your leg shorter or longer, alter them accordingly. Now that we know how long the leg should be, we can cut some styrene, right? Not so fast. If you think you might ever want to create another billboard to these dimensions, stop and make a gauge block. What is a gauge block? It is a piece of dimensionally stable material, such as brass, UHMW, or Corian, cut to the exact length of the desired part. The gauge block is then used to set the distance of a chopper's blade to its stop block. You never again have to try to measure the distance to place the stop block from the blade. You just place the gauge block on the chopper, slide the stop block over, and forget about it. So, rough cut a piece of material. I use 3 millimeter square brass rod, a bit over length, and gently file or sand off the end until it is the proper length. Make a gauge block for both the vertical leg the sloped leg, the cross member, and the diagonal support. If you plan on making more billboards than just one size, make a set of gauge blocks for each size. Yes, it's worth. Just do it. You can thank me later. When I make my gauge blocks, I uh, then paint them. Uh, so the, the yellow gauge blocks are for the 8-foot uh, billboards, and I make a little bigger size for the 10s as well. Now, using the gauge block, cut the vertical leg to size. Using the sloped gauge block, cut a sloped leg to about one quarter inch oversize, miter one end, and then cut the other end to size with a 90 degree cut. The sloped end will not be perfectly flat to the ground, and that never bothered me. But if it bothers you, chop off the angle with your hobby knife. The result will be a perfectly vertical billboard which after final assembly may be a bit unstable on your layout. You may want to nip off one eighth of an inch to one quarter inch from the sloped leg to make it more stable. 
Initially, I wanted a vertical board, but more recently have gone for something more stable. Be advised. Now let's glue the two legs together. I first place a dab of glue on the mitered edge of the sloped piece and place it in the fixture. Then I place a dab of glue on the end of the vertical piece and place it into the fixture, such that the top of each piece meet at the top of the fixture. The slots in the fixture are about a hundredth of an inch wider than the styrene, so I carefully wedge my hobby knife blade between the outside edge of the legs and the fixture so that the legs have a good close fit, and I wait 15 to 20 seconds for the joint to set. I then put the point of my hobby knife under the joint and pop it out of the fixture and set it aside to cure, which takes about 2 to 24 hours. Don't rush the cure time. While waiting for the two legs to cure, cut the cross member. The length of the cross member will be a function of the height of the face frame assembly. The taller the sign, the longer the cross member. I'll spare you the trigonometry, but my fixtures require that the cross member be 1.42, 1.62, 1.43, 1.44, and 2.06 inches respectively for 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16 foot high billboards. These lengths are not critical, so feel free to cut these a bit longer if you like. Using a gauge block to set the length, cut some evergreen 164 styrene about a quarter inch longer than recommended, miter a 60 degree angle, and cut it to the recommended length. Similarly, Use your gauge block to set up the cut for the diagonal cross brace, 0 0.86 inches, 1.10, 1.25, 1.42, and 1.62 inches. Cut oversize, cut a 60 degree angle, square off the end to the proper length. No approximations here. Now that the two legs have cured, place the cross member in the fixture making sure that the angled end is facing properly in the proper slot of the fixture. For an 8-foot face frame, use the shortest slot. For a 16-foot face frame, use the longest slot. You will notice that the cross member slots are deeper than the leg slots. This is so that after placing the cross member in the fixture, you can apply a dab of glue where the cross member intersects the legs. Then reinsert the legs into the fixture and press the pieces together, and the fixture will hold all three pieces in place. Wait 15 to 20 seconds for the pieces to bond, and then use a hobby knife to pry the pieces from the fixture. Wait a few hours for these pieces to cure. Before gluing the diagonal support, note that the square cut end of the diagonal brace will attach to the sloped leg and the mitered end to the vertical leg, so rotate the diagonal support until they fit. The diagonal support is in the same plane as the two legs, so don't try to glue it to the cross member. It might help to put the three-piece assembly on a piece of glass, legs on the flat surface and cross member above, then slide the glued ends of the diagonal support in place. Now, rough cut, miter, and final cut the diagonal support and glue it into place. Wait overnight for the assembly to cure. Once the new day dawns, make sure the area where the sloped leg feeds the cross member and the diagonal support is flat. If not, take a file or sandpaper and flatten it. Now it is time to attach the legs to the face frame. Don't try to attach the legs to the frame assembly without first placing a piece of ultra-high molecular weight or even wood on your tabletop so that the cross member, the thing that will eventually hold the boardwalk, has some place to drape while gluing the legs. I like to place the legs about an inch apart. Take your time with them, but faster setting glue like Plastruct Bondeed might make it easier than longer setting glue. Do your best to keep the legs perpendicular to the frame assembly. Short, inch-wide pieces of UHMW between the legs will make this easier. The legs will start to set in 15 to 60 seconds, but if you can, 
give the joint 15 minutes or so before gluing the next leg to give the joint some brief time to set up. Alternately, and while not absolutely essential, I made an assembly fixture to assist in this task, and it helped a lot. Before gluing the boardwalk, place the face frame into the large slot of the fixture, face down. Line it up so the legs are equally spaced across the long side of the face frame, and that the top of the face frame is aligned with the top of the leg assembly. Take a leg assembly and glue the top part with plastic weld. Insert the cross member into the hole between the two pieces of the fixture and press the top part of the leg into the sign and the bottom part into the long slot. Hold for 20 seconds and go on to the next leg set. Once all the legs are attached, cut a piece of Evergreen 144 wide enough to span all the legs and glue it to the sloped legs at the intersection of all the joints to serve as a brace for all the legs. Once dry, trim off the excess. Set the assembly on its legs and glue the boardwalk to the cross member. If desired, trim the legs to make a shorter sign. A straight edge might be useful to minimize the sign's wobble. Paint the entire structure. Since glue does not adhere well to a painted surface, make sure all parts are firmly attached before painting. I prefer flat colors over glossy, and I often try to make the colors of the structure complementary to the colors in the decal. Spray paints work for me, and I always give two coats to both the front and back. Apply the decal. My experience is that about 20 seconds in the water is all it takes to loosen the decal from the backing paper. Once dry, and if desired, spray the whole thing with dull coat. Place the sign on your layout and enjoy. Throughout the last section on making support structures, we made extensive use of assembly fixtures. But where did they come from? The short answer is, I made them. Today we don't have time to cover just how that is done, but there is another resource. I have a website at http colon slash slash daacm dot g-i-t-h-u-b dot i-o. And toward the bottom of the site, there is a section which contains pointers to all the videos we have seen today, plus a 16-minute section on how I made the fixtures. I have an extensive wood shop in my basement with tools like a table saw and router table with a router lift, and these tools were necessary to make the fixtures. If you don't have such large bench tools, perhaps some makerspace in your area does, or maybe someone in your train club who is also into woodworking could help you in their shop. But always remember that such tools are dangerous and your safety is your responsibility. If you lack experience or training, ask for help. The material I used in the fixtures is ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, or UHMW for short. Because it is so slippery and glue doesn't stick to my fixtures during assembly. UHMW is available from woodworking stores such as Rockler and Woodcraft and even plastic supply merchants in large cities. But I prefer to buy mine from Peachtree Supply at http colon slash slash www.ptreusa.com. Why? because their UHMW pieces seem to have finer grain and are easier to machine. I use 3 seconds and 1 8 inch carbide router bits to machine the material, but even smaller bits would be required if you want billboards for something smaller than HO. A digital height gauge and brass setup blocks are also almost indispensable. In a nutshell, the leg alignment fixture is a piece of 4 inch by 3 quarter inch UHMW, 4 and a quarter inches long, on which I located the center and cut a 60 degree angle. I routed 3 32nd inch slots along the two longer sides. I very carefully cut off the top point and routed slots perpendicular to the middle length side. The slots were at different locations to be used for different sized signs. The fixture for the boardwalk can be made from just about any thickness of UHMW. 
one and three eighths by six inches. I routed the slots 15 hundredths of an inch apart and extremely shallow using a one eighth inch bit. The final assembly fixture is made from a piece of five and a half inch UHMW cut lengthwise, one and three eighths inch from the long side. The larger piece is thinned down from three quarters inch to 0 0.59 inches using a large router bit, leaving short wings at either end. The smaller piece has three 32nd inch slots cut in the short side and again on the long side, with the long side slots being offset three 32nd inch from the short sides. The pieces are then glued together with contact cement. There are more details to constructing the fixtures in its video. It is now September of 2021. It has been 30 months since I first created this clinic. Building billboards using styrene and ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene assembly fixtures is still a fun, low-cost way to define time and place on your layout. But not everyone has access to a shop to create the fixtures. In 2020, I purchased Creality's Ender 3 Pro 3D printer from Micro Center for about $250, and it has provided me with an alternative way to create the billboard leg sets and boardwalks that I would like to share with you. Getting from an idea to a completed 3D object requires three steps. Number one, either designing an object using computer-aided design software or downloading someone else's design from a library. Number two, converting the design into instructions for a specific model of 3D printer, a process called slicing. And number three, printing the physical object on a 3D printer. I am not going to teach you 3D design software, but I am going to show you a library of 3D designs I created for my billboards. There is a website called thingiverse.com which contains thousands of designs for 3D objects, many of them suitable for model railroading. I like the design of my original leg sets based on a 30, 60, 90 degree triangle, and I used 3D design software to create leg sets in the five heights I discussed in the original clinic, utilizing artwork from 8 to 16 feet tall in HO scale. All you need to do is visit Thingiverse.com and search for D-A-A-C-K-M, and you will find the completed models. Just click on an item of interest and click on the button to download the model file. in your download folder. So unzip it, open the files folder, and you will find a stereolithography file, or STL file, which you can save to your hard drive. Now you are ready to go to step two, slicing. A model file is a generic collection of triangles, and to print an object, we now need to convert the model file into movements of the specific 3D printer you are using. I use free slicer software called Cura to perform this task. I import the STL file, click on the slice button to do the conversion, and then the save button to save the resulting instructions, called a G code, to a micro SD card. The third step is the actual printing. For me, this involves placing the micro SD card in my printer, selecting the file I wish to print, and hitting a button to start the print. Your printer may work differently, so follow your manufacturer's instructions. I also have a Thingiverse model for the boardwalk, suitable for any billboard height. Just follow the process to download, slice, and print it as needed. The boardwalk is pretty wide, so just use a hobby knife to cut it to the length you need.
Constructing the backer board using styrene is simple and quick, but on a 3D printer could easily take several hours to print. So I recommend cutting this part and its frame and back stiffeners using evergreen styrene. 3D printing is complicated and there is a learning curve, but it can be quite rewarding. There are many other 3D models available on Thingiverse which are applicable to model railroading. I hope you give this technique for creating billboard support structures a try. So there you have it. If you have any questions after the presentation, I can be reached at Ackmans at charter.net. And don't forget the website. Now let's open things up for questions. Hello, I am Dave Ackman, and I want to welcome you to this series of videos on the creation of Hang on, guys. posters for model railroads. My railroad is the Baden Boat and Dismet, the names of the elementary schools I attended back in the 1950s. There we go. We finally got it done. All right, I'm going to try to stop yep. sharing here if I can figure out how to do that, but I don't see it. I right can on. do it. Okay, terrific. Well, that was kind of like uh, drinking from a fire hose. A lot of information in a short period of time. Uh, I don't see any way that my image uh, gets uh, put on the screen there. So if you, uh, uh, if you start your camera, Dave. Yeah, I, d I do have it started, and uh, when I started uh, a free conference call, it briefly came up here, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, oh, there it is. There we go. All right. Thanks. Thanks. So, questions, Jeff? What do we got there? Uh, can you ask anybody in the audience to get any questions for Dave? Bueller? Let me get the joke. Dave, I think everybody's good. All right, good. I have uh, an offer and a request for, uh, before we call it a day here. Uh, I know making these fixtures, uh, while very, very important, is tough for folks that don't have a good wood shop. So one thing I offer whenever I teach this clinic if you will send me, Jeff, or, or, or for anybody, uh, your, uh, web, your, your mail address, your snail mail address. Je I'm only going to do this once, so Jeff, if you would do it. I will send a set of assembly fixtures to you for your division free of charge. So if folks want to, to give this a try, uh, this one's on me. So if you will email me uh, your mailing address, we'll make it happen. And then second, uh, I'm working on my uh, AP certificate for volunteers, and I've taught uh, close to four dozen clinics virtually. Would you send me an email and uh, verify or acknowledge that this clinic did take place? And sure. uh, then, then that gets me another point, and I think this will be point 56 for me toward being a, a volunteer. So uh, that's kind of where we're going. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Four more to go. Okay, there we go. How, I'm going to ask, uh, how many people in the, in the group have uh, have a 3D printer? Could you uh, show hands? And Jeff, let me show, let me know what the audience says. We got about 20 people here, and it's a grand total of zero. Whoa. Well, let me tell you, I teach a couple other clinics on 3D printing, and I'm going to be teaching one at uh, national, and uh, if you could let me share again just for a minute, can you do that? Uh, boy, you're really challenging me now. Okay, back. <laughs> to... oh. I don't know why it does this. There we go. All right. Okay, I'm going to uh, start sharing my desktop again, and I'm going to go, um, well, I'll just show you what I've got here. I'm working on some stuff for 3D printing model building.
and this is going to be a clinic around the end of July. I've written a program. And it'll start in just a little bit. That looks like this. I've wanted to build buildings more easily in 3D printing. So I said, let there be several styles of building, a clapboard, a log cabin, board and batten siding. And let me build a building that's 80 millimeters wide and 40 millimeters uh, tall, and uh, let the wall height be 35 millimeters. Uh, each clapboard is going to be 2.33 millimeters tall, which is 8 inches in HO. And I've got the angle here. But I can change all these values. And if I want to, I'm going to generate uh, oh, a basic building here. And I'm going to exit. OK, and I'm going to uh, move this down here so it gets it out of the way. I'm going to open another package called OpenSCAD. And it's going to think about this. It's going to take my parameters. and build the 3D model with clapboard siding just that easily. And I could alter all the dimensions. I could change this height from a peak to a, a straight across, like I was building a coal bin or things like that. And I can 3D print this thing. And I can add windows and doors and uh, basically uh, build any type of structure that I want. Now, you've got a grand total of zero folks are there that have 3D printers. But I'm here to tell you that that's the next place that you guys are going to be going. Uh, you know, if you're in DCC, you're going to get into 3Ds. But I got so frustrated trying to design my buildings that I wrote a program which writes a program that helps me build 3D models. So. Uh, I call it automating CAD, and that's going to be a new clinic that's going to be available uh, around uh, the end of July. And if I go to my website, scroll down a little bit, here I've got a program that generates shake shingles as 3D, and that's what it looks like when it comes out as a model. So uh, stay tuned with me, and I'll let you know when this thing's ready for uh, for prime time, but your guys are going to get into 3D printing uh, hopefully fairly soon. So that's just another thing that's, uh, that I'm, where I'm playing with these days. Oh, thanks, Dave. So, so that's that. And uh, uh, any more questions? Anything coming up? All right. Thanks for your time, and I hope you pick something up here. Maybe you can't use it right now, but maybe you will uh, in the the next year or so. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, that is the uh, end of the agenda for today. Don, would you like to uh, promote the layout, please? Sorry? Do you want to talk about the layout for us? Yeah. Um, layout is just an attitude and Middletown, and
Okay. Definitely. Anybody else got anything else you want to say before we adjourn this meeting, the annual meeting? No? Appreciate everybody coming. Uh, have a good uh, day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. See you. Does that one? And on? This one?